Yellowstone. It's it's a lot different than it is on television, I can tell you that. For two years, I've been a ranch hand, working the land on the Paramount Network series Yellowstone, a role I was born to play. See, as a kid, I discovered my love for this giant, wild punch bowl where the sky just goes on forever. But today, something is amiss. Yellowstone is seeing changes that have hunters and ranchers, scientists and park visitors alike concerned, not just for the future of the park, but for the planet itself. I want to know why this particular place is so important, why this environment, this ecosystem can answer the bigger questions that we have. So this trip is different from the ones I took as a child. This trip isn't about discovering nature's beauty, but about finding out what I can do to preserve it. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So my name is Eric Oberg. I am the founder of the Phenology Project here in Yellowstone. Phenology is uh, the study of nature's calendar, right? So we are Like me, Eric Oberg came to Yellowstone as a kid and fell in love. Okay, let's take a look. Today, he's a biologist and a Yellowstone Park Ranger who leads a team of volunteer citizen scientists that study how the park's plants, flowers, and insects are adapting to a changing environment. This is uh, one of the world's most pristine natural laboratories. It's really a, uh, one of the places that gets us as close as we can be to the most natural conditions that, that we find on Earth. I would imagine that studying cycles and patterns are going to highlight changes that the ecosystem is going through. Nature is always changing, but here in Yellowstone, we have some really clear evidence that that pace of change is happening faster. Spring is now coming about a month sooner than it did 30 years ago. 30 years ago. Yeah, a month change in about 30 years of time. Someone who understands the challenges facing Yellowstone better than most is Dr. Mike Tursik, a PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology. He's one of 875 permanent residents of Gardner, Montana, a gateway to the park. Here, he spent the last 20 years exploring and studying his town's next door neighbor. Can you, can you tell me why it, it's so important that we use this ecosystem here at Yellowstone? This was a national park before there was a National Park Service, you know, 1872. It was the place where preserving nature was born, you could argue. If we can't protect this and do the things to maintain it, what does that mean for the rest of the world, the life support system that keeps us alive? To better understand the scale of the threat that a warmer and drier climate means for Yellowstone, we decide to get out of the weeds and into the clouds. All of these down trees, that's fire damage. Yeah, when you're high up like this, you can really see the, the scale of the problem. You have forests like white bark pine that took 20 human generations to grow that are gonna be wiped out in one generation and they won't have time to recover. You have, uh, you know, at the northeast entrance in Yellowstone, since the 1960s, we have one month less of snow cover than we used to. What would you say to people who would argue that the differences that we're seeing are an anomaly, that if you zoom out far enough, it's gonna be just a blip, and it's not as bad as you think, and it's gonna be part of the normal course corrections of the planet? The biggest difference is the rate of the change that we're talking about. And it's, it's very well correlated to industrial activity. If you run the climate projections out into the future under a business as usual scenario, you'll have years that are as dry as 1988, which was considered you know, like a 300 year event. By 2050 or so, that'll happen every three to five years, which means that uh, it'll become a charred moonscape. So if we would just lose all the majesty of our forest. Yeah, you know, I think a lot of people will say, well, it'll still be wild and it'll still be different. But I have to disagree. You know, we're in the early stages of what I consider to be a catastrophe, and you can't hide how you feel about this anymore. This, for me, has to work out a certain way. We need to stop the problem before it gets to that point. One person doing his part to stop the problem is Charlie Abel, 
a local engineer and lifelong outdoorsman. Charlie's joining me in the park today to help collect data on bison. What's that? Oh, I heard a tone. That's uh, right. So there's a collared animal. Right there. And we just oh, sort of closer. metal detect your way to a... You metal detect your way in. Our turn as citizen scientists is led by park ranger and wildlife biologist, Chris Jeremiah. Jeremiah runs a team of volunteers who monitor the impact shorter growing seasons have on Yellowstone's largest mammals. What these bison do is they regraze the same area over and over and over again. It's kind of like cutting your lawn with a lawnmower. And as a result, the grass is never mature. They're soft, they're nutritious, they're the same things you'd find on a watered lawn. And then we're trying to figure out, well, how does that affect all the other animals in the park? The answer to that question lies somewhere in grass clippings, soil samples, and bison poop, or scat, as the scientists like to call it. So once you put these on, don't wipe your nose. OK. <laughs> so here's one. That one's pretty fresh in there. OK. Can we flag it? All right, this is a team effort. OK. And I'm just going to kind of. Yeah, just nice and gently. Voila. I was upset when I got the spoon to begin with, but now <laughs> you're, you're happier about I'm it. I'm happy that I got the spoon and you got the bags. <laughs> I think the biggest take home from bison is to realize that these animals are incredibly resilient. They don't just move to find food, but how they move makes food. And they're very smart. And they're just going to adapt to these changes. Or try to. Or try to. Try to. Because the hard thing is what what happens if they can't? All these systems have like time scales that they naturally can adapt on. If you try to go faster than that, like you're kind of outrunning what they're capable of. We know that the, the temperatures and the precipitation patterns have changed fairly drastically in northern Yellowstone over the last 100 years. So that's probably happening maybe more rapid relative to how animals are learning. That does mean the animal populations in Yellowstone 20, 50 years from now may look entirely different than they do today. The way that I understand the whole system working, all of the parts work together. And I didn't realize how land did that in this way. The soil and the ground and what lives on it shape one another. And it's a continuing dance cycle of life. You know, I've never felt so motivated to be a better dance partner, I guess. My fellow bison scat collector, Charlie Abel, has been dancing with climate change for decades. First, as an MIT-trained engineer who started a mining and drilling company with his dad, and as a lifelong hunter and fisherman. Now, he's a dedicated volunteer for the national nonpartisan organization, Citizens Climate Education, and will talk to anybody who will listen about climate change solutions. Most people have opinions about this, like it's kind of a polarized thing. Mm -hmm. But if you start drilling down into exactly what people know, you can help draw them into a conversation. A lot of people that might disagree that this phenomenon of climate change is even real or existing are the most adversely affected by it, and there are outdoors people. Will it take them to lose things and see it before they want to make an effort? It might. That's the unfortunate truth. Like, the streams might have to get warm enough that trout have trouble surviving. We might have to lose some big game. Stuff like that might have to happen for people to realize, hey, this is affecting me. So there's gotta be a way to plug in the people that don't know what they don't know. It's, it's, it's not economical. I wanna put something in their heart and shock them so they, they wake up. Yeah, so, and I think everybody wants to do that, but the reality is you can't, you can't push or shock people. That's why I take the approach that I do because I think, honestly, it's the only one that can be successful. We are on a piece of paradise Just one time in our life A chance to see the stars There's a piece of Yellowstone that's 22 miles from the nearest road, the most remote patch of land in all the lower 48 states. But no matter how far it is from asphalt or industry, it's still ground zero for rapid climate change. So why am I leaving here more hopeful than ever? 
because I'm leaving with the knowledge that citizens like you and me are fighting for this wild, magical place. The real trick is to kind of call the legislators. Like, they'll actually listen. And so that's why I'm going around talking to people. Just because it's not happening today and just because it doesn't look like it's going to happen tomorrow, we just keep grinding away and, and we'll get there. I was really inspired by what President Johnson said in 1964 when he signed the Wilderness Act, which is, you know, pretty connected to a place like Yellowstone. He said that if future generations are going to remember us with gratitude rather than contempt, we must leave them more than the miracles of modern technology. We must leave them a glimpse of the world as it was when it was new, not just after we got through with it. It's not a science problem, it's a human problem. You have to reach people in a, a way that they care about, get them to care about a particular place like Yellowstone. After my trip to Yellowstone, I care about this place more than ever. And I'm gonna talk to as many people as I can about not only what's happening here, but what that means for our planet. Do you wanna take action? Citizens Climate Education gives ordinary citizens the power to educate political leaders, the media, and the general public about climate change solutions. Find your local chapter and get started today.